Happy Sunday. Good morning. Good to see all of you here. Praise God. We're, we're thankful that you've chosen to worship with us today. Uh, we want to invite you to stand with us as we begin our service and uh, sing these songs to our Lord. Uh, God, we thank you that you are king of the universe. God, you are sovereign over all, Lord, and you are the, the closest to us, uh, Lord, that, that we could ever be. Lord, your word says that you allow us to draw near to your presence through the blood of Jesus. And so, God, as we, we sing these songs, would you remind us of all that we have to be thankful for in Christ? God, that, that uh, the Lord is sufficient for us and our needs. God, and as we cry out to you, your word says that you inhabit the praises of your people. And so we're thankful, Lord, again, that you are not a distant God, but you are near to us right now. Lord, we love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, let's sing this together. Let praise. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise, let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. Let faith be the song that overcomes the raging sea. Let faith be the song that comes the storm inside of me. Let it rise. the giants fall, for fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. we praise you. Oh, This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. Come on, church, let's give God praise this morning. Amen. Let's put our hands together for his goodness and grace. Hallelujah. 
Presence of my enemies, sing a little louder, louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder, my weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder, heaven comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder, in the presence of my enemies, sing a little louder. grateful that the king is alive. Amen. Amen. We worship you, Lord. You may be seated in the presence of God. Thank you very much, worship team. Well, good morning. Welcome to Heritage Bible Church. Let me ask you a question. How many of you uh, know where our missionary board is? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have looked at it lately? Okay. Uh, if you go back in the social hall, you'll see pictures of, of missionaries that we support. And I don't know if you realize or not, there's clipboards of, of pictures with missionaries. And behind those pictures are recent letters that they've sent to the church. Uh, every month or two, we, re we continue to receive uh, current letters from missionaries to tell us what's going on. And if you get those letters, you can find out what's going on in the lives of missionaries and you know how to pray for them. How many of you have picked up one of the letters from the missionaries in the last five weeks? Raise your hand. Okay, two people, three people. Okay, that's why I thought it would be good to have a couple of Mission Commission members share some highlights of recent missionary letters. And so I want to invite Vanessa Ramirez and Jolene McGee to come up. They're each going to share highlights. Uh, I believe Vanessa is going to be sharing highlights from uh, the candidates. That's right. And Jolene's going to share some highlights from uh, Nasser, who was here last November, Nasser al Khatani. Okay, so Canada's uh, work with Chris Starr, and they're based in, in Dallas, Texas. And uh, Nasser works in the Arab world, overseeing uh, outreach to Muslims. So 
Um, you want to go first, Vanessa? Sure. You'd love to, wouldn't you? <laughs> okay, great. Um, so we got a letter from Holly, um, and this is just like an update on their life um, and different aspects of it. Um, so she says that work is going well for Randy at the CMCUS. Um, he has recruited a team to help him in forming a plan and policies for the two new incentives or initiatives, sorry, remobilizing cross-cultural workers and the initial structure of how these initiatives uh, relate to Christar has been approved by the U.S. Board. So she asked that we pray for wisdom for him in moving forward with that. Um, Holly uh, received her Texas medical license um, in April 1st. Uh, she also found a job working for Signify Health um, to visit seniors um, in their homes to perform their annual health assessments. Her credentials were also approved and she completed training for the work. Um, uh, she said that she was ready to start in July, but when she turned in her hours, um, her recruiter said that um, the schedule for July was already set and the only visits available were in Amarillo and Midland, which are four to five hours away from where they're at now. Um, they did say that they will pay for the hotel expenses, but it is further than she wanted to go. Um, so she turned in her hours for August, and if the Lord's willing, she'll get assigned work closer to home. Uh, in terms of family, Renee finished her first year of college at UW, and she um, has started a summer job working at UN, uh, UNL Biology uh, Department. Uh, Russ continues to work part-time as uh, security for a chicken processing plant, and Ryan finished his third year at GCU. Uh, he also got his driver's license. <laughs> um, and she asked that we pray for their, their children um, to hear his voice and walk closely to Jesus. Um, uh, in their church, um, they got a new pastor. His name was Joe Thomas. He lives a few blocks away from them, and Holly says that he has a real heart for prayer. Uh, Randy has started to lead a home group um, on Sunday evenings, studying through The Bondage Breaker by Neil Anderson. And Holly has been involved in outreach to newcomers in the area. And she asked that we uh, pray for her as she speaks um, to like the ladies in her Bible study and to the newcomers. And she also mentions that um, Turkish Muslims have come into their lives. She met a woman named Fatma while walking in the neighborhood. And Fatma invited the candidates over for an iftar meal um, for breaking the fast during Ramadan. Um, and Fatma also invited them uh, to Raindrop, which is the Turkish center in a uh, town where she teaches the Quran. And Holly also met a Turkish neighbor named Deniz through the church's outreach to newcomers. And she invited Holly and Fatma over for Turkish breakfast. Um, they haven't done that yet, but she does pray for that opportunity. And so that's the update on the Kennedys. I have to put on my cheaters here. <laughs> okay. Okay, this was Nasser's first tr international trip since the pandemic. He recently traveled to Sudan with Irfan, one of the leaders in Egypt who recently served 17, year who served 17 years in Sudan before he was expelled from the country due to political reasons. Sudan is mostly a Muslim country that has reopened its doors to the gospel. He said, I was recently after arriving in Sudan, Irfan and I felt led to host a mission training seminar. So we asked the church to send us people for training. We were so amazed at the group that God's put together. The participants were mostly in their 20s with very little ministry experience, but, when, but they were obviously handpicked by God. The highlight of the training for me was seeing people become so excited about what they were learning. They caught the vision of studying the Bible for themselves. They kept saying, now we know. Before, we knew what we should believe. Now we truly believe it for ourselves. We watched as they became more and more confident in biblical truth, and they felt more and more equipped to share with others. Our intent was to make the training as practical as possible to focus on prayer and listening to the Holy Spirit. By the second day, after some practical training, we sent them, sent them out two by two into the market. Each group shared about how much the Holy Spirit directed them to the right people 
men and women of peace whose hearts were soft and ready to hear the gospel. Almost every team led at least one person to Jesus that day. Irfan and I were in tears for most of the evening. We were so grateful. We came to Sudan with high expectations, and Jesus blew us away with his grace, mercy, and love. And then he asked that you would please pray for the participants in their mission training. Pray for each one that they would be fruitful in their, fruitful in their evangelism, and second, for the possibility of more training events like this across North Africa. Okay, thank you. Can you hang on to that for just a minute? Pardon? Just hang on to it. Okay. Okay. I want to share about one other missionary we support, and that is Safari. Safari is the president of the Mennonite Brethren Conference in Malawi. Um, a couple of months ago, the Mission Commission had a, a Zoom conference call with him, and we were able to talk to him. Uh, it's about an 11-hour time difference, uh, just hearing about his work in, in Malawi. Um, his background is really interesting. Our, our hope is that we can bring Safari to be our speaker for Harvest Sunday this coming November 21st. Um, but you need to know a little bit about his background. Uh, he and his family grew up in Eastern Congo. They were part of a group of people that basically raised cattle. Uh, but because of a lot of uh, different ethnic groups in Congo. There was a lot of strife. There was a lot of racial turmoil. Um, his people were, were mistreated um, because of their ethnicity. Uh, fortunately, despite that, uh, Safari's father was a pastor, and so Safari grew up in a Christian home. He was involved in church. In fact, Safari led the, the church choir in, in which his father was the pastor there. And then as he was praying one, one night, uh, he felt as if God was leading him to, to leave that church and, and go to a new city. And so he told his father, and his father gave him blessings to do that. And so he went in, into a nearby city. That's where he was introduced to a Mennonite church, and he fell in love with that, and he uh, got involved. He began working with young people. He began t leading their choir. Um, he loved their emphasis on, on peace and reconciliation and forgiveness. He was attracted to that. Uh, especially in a country where there's a lot of turmoil. And, and so he continued to be, his people continued to be mistreated. In fact, his life was even threatened. And then in 2003, uh, his parents, while they were trying to flee from their home, his parents ended up being murdered in Congo. And so at that point, uh, Safari felt he needed to, to get out of the country. And so he fled to the country of Burundi. Uh, for three years, he stayed in a refugee camp. Then he was hoping he could go back to Congo to see if the situation had changed at all. And he went back, and he discovered that the situation was still tense. There was a lot of uh, racial uh, violence going on and, and threats going on. And so he decided to, to flee, and uh, he left uh, the country again, and this time went to Malawi. It took him four months to get, get to Malawi. He ended up in a refugee camp there, and he discovered that there was a lot of tension and hostility in the refugee camp. A lot of uh, racial uh, enmity. Uh, all the different ethnic groups just hung out with themselves and, and had hatred toward the other groups. He says that witchcraft was predominant, uh, and so it was frustrating. And so he decided he felt he had a gift of evangelism, and so he, did, he worked at, at going door to door, uh, sharing the gospel with different people, and he found people were responsive. And so he was able to start the first church there in the refugee camp in Malawi, uh, and people were very excited about that. He talked about peace, he talked about forgiveness, he talked about reconciliation. And for people in turmoil, that was, that was really good, and it created a spiritual family for them. Um, and then uh, after a while, there was a man that joined their church. His name was Gilbert. And Safari found out that, that Gilbert also was a refugee from Congo. And so he invited Gilbert into his home to, to live with him, to help him adjust to, adjust to life in the refugee camp. And over the course of time, uh, Safari learned that, that Gilbert was the man that murdered his parents. Okay? And what happened next, that's a miracle of God. And I'm going to have Safari share that with you next November when he comes to, to be here, okay? Um, but that, that's who our speaker is going to be, hopefully, next November. 
Uh, and he's going to talk about that experience and talk about the power of God. It's a tremendous story. Today, there are 52 Mennonite Brethren churches in Malawi, primarily because of Safari, his leadership, and, and churches that have begun. That they have created their own conference. There's the, the MB conference you know, in, in Malawi of, of churches. And so uh, that's something we look forward to. Um, so we wanted to give you an update on some of our missionaries and what you can look forward to in the next few months as we look forward to, to Harvest Sunday. So at this time, we want to go ahead and dismiss children up through sixth grade to go with Jen Gonzalez, and they're going to go to Heritage Kids and have their separate program. Okay, so kids can, can go and at this point. The rest of you, why don't you go ahead and stand, greet those around you as we continue worship. Okay? Thanks, ladies. Okay, so after a few minutes, you. Never stand up. Well, if you start talking, they might sit down. <laughs> Is it on? No, it's not. I don't think. Yeah, the red lights are. Wait, wave, to, wave to Mark, he'll turn it on.
right, if you guys could make your way to your seats here, I got some announcements for you guys. I don't think they like me, JD. I did. I'm waiting for everybody to sit down. They can totally hear me to this All right, so got some announcements for you guys. Um, starting off, Jim is doing a Journeys men group, men's group starting Monday night, 6 to 7 on August 23rd. Um, if you're interested, talk to him. You can try it out for a month and see if you want to continue. On top of that for Journey, they're also doing a men's retreat on the 28th and 29th of August in Tehachapi. It's a full 24-hour retreat. There's going to be speakers, games, all sorts of fun stuff like that. Good food, which is the best part, right? <laughs> and after that, we've also got um, giving options for the church. So as you've seen, it's always in there. There's the offering box in the foyer, but we also have the app that you can give through. You can give to the Koinia Fund through there as well. Um, talk to Pastor Roger if you need help downloading that. And last but not least, we have a gift for first-time guests. It's in the back through those double doors. It's this, the big information booth thing that's on the left in the social hall. Go there after the service if you are a first-time guest and you want a gift. Thank you. Let's give it up for our summer intern. We love you, Braden. Hey, we want to invite you to stand as we continue worship this morning, singing to our God. Let's lift them high this morning, oh Christ, be magnified. Oh, Christ, be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ, be magnified in me. Oh, Christ, be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ, be magnified. I 
Father, we thank you, uh, Lord, that you have given us uh, Jesus. As we sing this new song, God, we're reminded of the fact that uh, this is not our home. Lord, heaven is our home, and, and you are our destiny forever. God, we'll be with you for eternity. We glorify you this morning, God. To breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone And mercy fills the streets To look upon The one who bled to save me And walk with him For all eternity There will be there will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Desperation, the songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear. In the end, we'll know that it was worth it when He returns to wipe away our tears. We excited for that day this morning, church. There will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. day we join the resurrection we stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain we sing that you reign God forever so let it be, let it be today, we shall 
the hymn of heaven with angels and the saints we raise a mighty Lord glory to our God who gave us life beyond the Is any good? Is any righteous? Amen. Let's sing that chorus one more time, and just uh, wait with expectation for the day that we get to see our Savior face to face. I'm excited. So uh, there will be. So there will be a day when all will bow before Him. There will be a day when death will be. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord, as you are holy, God. Holy, holy is the Amen, church. Come on, let's give God some praise this morning. He is holy and set apart and perfect and pure. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Let me just add a, a couple of uh, points about the, uh, the Journey Men's Retreat, M24, which was in four weeks from... Today, this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, 24-hour retreat. Um, starts Saturday noon, goes to Sunday noon up at Tehachapi. It's at Tehachapi. It's, it's at Indian Hill Ranch RV Park. Uh, and the one, one item that uh, uh, Braden forgot to mention is that it's free, gentlemen. It is absolutely free. Uh, at this point, 400 men have signed up. Uh, they have capacity for 1,000 men. So if you want to bring uh, an RV or a trailer or a tent or a sleeping bag, I'm going to uh, take a Nets car and sleep in the, the back. Um, and uh, you can do that. Or if you want to just uh, sleep out under the stars, you can do that. Uh, if you're at all interested, you can just sign up online. It's that, that easy. Come see me if you're interested. Uh, so if it's Saturday noon to Sunday noon, I won't be here preaching on that Sunday. In fact, that'll be the last Sunday of our series in David. And let me uh, show you who's going to be preaching that day. So, Justin, I caught you off guard. I want you to stand up. Okay, look at Justin. Okay. <laughs> Justin's the husband of Elise, our uh, third grade teacher here at the school. And Justin is a former pastor and a life coach now. And so he's going to be preaching on Psalm 145. Okay, and that'll be the conclusion to our series on David, so you'll want to hear that. Okay, I want to share one prayer request with you. I was in contact with Kristen Hayes on Thursday morning because I had to ask her a question about something we're planning later this month. And uh, she answered my question and then let me know that she and her family were heading off to Monterey because uh, uh, to attend a memorial service for... Uh, an uncle of hers who had passed away, I believe it's the, the uncle that had passed away in New York a few months ago and they couldn't do a, a service until now. Uh, and so I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Then she let me know that, that just the night before, on Wednesday night, her grandfather uh, had passed away who had been under hospice care. And so the family got, got hit with a, a double whammy there. Uh, getting ready to attend the memorial service for an uncle, and then a grandpa passes away and said, uh, wants you to be praying for them, pray for Daniel and Kristen and the kids, and the, so they'll, they'll become, they're coming home from a memorial service to attend another uh, service probably this week, so I want to lift them up. 
Our current sermon series is on David. It's called David, a man of faith and flaws. In the last two months, we've studied the life of David, and we've noticed different aspects uh, of what he was able to accomplish through God's strength and power. We've learned that, that David was a shepherd, but he was also a poet and a musician. He's the author of many of the Psalms that we have in the Old Testament. But in addition to that, we know that, that he was a soldier, he was a king. In fact, he was probably the greatest king Israel ever had in the Old Testament. And then we also know a slogan that describes him as that he was a man after God's own heart. And while he had many positive attributes, he was far from perfect. John Maxwell shares an insight on leadership. I want to share with you, put it, we'll put it up on the screen. Maxwell says, ability may get you to the top, but it is character that keeps you there. So how does a strong leader go from a position of power and prominence to making decisions that cause a family or a ministry to crumble. For someone like David, it may have been little things that, that appear innocent or acceptable at the time, and yet as they accumulate, they end up causing serious damage. And so our message this morning is entitled, Cracks in the Foundation Equal consequences in the future, because that describes David's life. There's a sermon outline that's on your app. There were some sermon outlines, some hard copies that were passed out uh, from ushers if you wanted one when, when you came in. A couple of weeks ago, we, we studied the event of David's disobedience, which really involved two aspects. One was deception. Uh, David deceived himself, convincing himself that, that committing adultery with Bathsheba would be okay. So decep deception was on one aspect, but then death was a second. David ends up arranging to have her husband killed when he learns that Bathsheba has become pregnant from their one night stand. The author of 2 Samuel chapter 12, as he concludes that chapter, uh, in the Old Testament, simply says that the Lord was, was displeased with what David had done. And so we read that the next thing that occurs is that, is that God sends Nathan to David to confront him about his deception and death that he caused. And I want you to notice the consequences that David has to face as a result. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12. Look at the first consequence in verse 10. Now Nathan is going to David, and it's really God speaking to David in verse 10, where he says, Now therefore the sword will never depart from your house, because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. The first consequence David must live with is death. God says the sword is never going to depart from your house. The second consequence is in the very next verse, verse 11 where Nathan goes on and says this, this is what the Lord says, out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you, and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. Second consequence is that family members are going to deceive him and cause calamity. Well, the first, first consequence is immediate. Look with me at verse 14. It says, but because, you, but because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. So the first consequence is going to be death, and the son born to Bathsheba will die. That begins years of misery for David and his family which really fulfills what we read last week when we read, read Galatians uh, 6, verse 7, where Paul writes and says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So David sowed deception and death, and that's exactly what he ends up reaping. Norman Vincent Peale shares a, a sad truth uh, in the following quote. And he says, nothing is more confusing 
than people who give good advice but set bad examples. And sadly, there are some Christians that, that cling to this misconception, this idea that where they, they tell themselves, well, if we just confess our sins and claim forgiveness, then all consequences will, will, are wiped away. That wasn't true in, in David's life, certainly. It won't be true in, in our life either. Chapter 13 in 2 Samuel continues a, a sad saga of deception and death in David's life. Two of David's children, Absalom and Tamar, were brother and sister. And there was a half-brother named Amnon who fell in love with Tamar. And he tricked her into coming into his bedroom where he ended up raping her. And then he, he threw her out and shunned her. Uh, very much disgracing her. And so in her disgrace, she went to live with her brother Absalom. And Absalom began plotting his revenge. For two years, Absalom never spoke with his half-brother Amnon. Then he decides to throw a party, and, Am and Absalom invites all of his brothers to come. And uh, uh, he, he throws that party with this one goal. Look with me at... at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 13, uh, verse 28 and part of 29. Absalom ordered his men, listen, when Amnon is in high spirits from drinking wine, and I say to you, strike Amnon down, then kill him. Don't be afraid. Uh, haven't I given you this order? Be strong and brave. So Absalom's men did what Amnon uh, did to Amnon what Absalom had ordered. At that point, Absalom knew that, that he had to leave town. Uh, there was no way David would allow him to remain in Israel, um, a killing a, a half-brother. And so look with me at the end of chapter 13, verse 38. It says, after Absalom fled and went to Geshur, he stayed there three years, and King David longed to go to Absalom. Absalom kills his half-brother. He flees town. He, he goes to uh, a region called Geshur, why? In Geshur was one of Absalom's grandfathers. In fact, his grandfather was king of that area, king of Geshur. And so he was able to stay with family for three years. Um, but then we, we go to the next chapter in chapter 14, and we see that, that David's emotions are torn. On one hand, he longs to, to see Absalom. On the other hand, he's angry because Absalom had killed one of his sons. Um, and then through another story of deception... David allows Absalom to return to the country, return and return to Jerusalem. He says, yeah, you can come back to live in Jerusalem, but it comes with conditions. Look at, at chapter 14, uh, verses 23 and 24. It says, then Joab went to Geshur and brought Absalom back to Jerusalem, but the king said, he must go to his, his own house. He must not see my face. So Absalom went to his own house and did not see the face of the king. So Absalom is back in town. He's, he's back in Jerusalem after three years. But has his relationship with his father David been restored? Not really. Not if they're willing to even meet face to face. Verse 29 says, this went on for two years. So after five years of Absalom not seeing or talking with his, his father David, Joab arranges for the two to meet, and that's described in verse 33, the last verse of chapter 14. So is there restoration now, now that they've met? Not really. Because Absalom has harbored a lot of resentment. There's probably more resentment than restoration at this point. Verse 25 of chapter 14 says that there was no one more handsome in the entire land than Absalom. So Absalom was popular. He was admired by people, and he used this. Absalom used this to his advantage to get back at his dad. Look at chapter 15, verse 1. It says, in the course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses and with 50 men to run ahead of him. What does that mean? Having a chariot, 
having horses, having 50 men who are willing to run in front of you are all symbols of, of royal status and military power. It was Absalom's way of, of showing off to others and implying, he implied to others as, as people would see him in his chariot and horse and, and 50 men, it implied he would be the next king following David, even though nothing official was, had been decided at, at that point. And so even though while he's riding around in his chariot, he carries his deception even farther. Look what he does starting in verse 2 of chapter 15. Talking about Absalom, he says, he would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out to him, what town are you from? He would answer, your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, look, your claims are valid and proper, but there is no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, if only I were appointed judge in the land, then everyone who has a complaint or case could come to me, and I would see that they receive justice. Also, whenever anyone approached him to bow down before him, Absalom would reach out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. Absalom behaved in this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice. And so he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. In ancient times, legal matters were often decided at the city gate, and so Absalom became a regular fixture at that spot in town. And he appeared sympathetic to, to people's needs, saying, if I were in charge, I would see that, that you would get justice. And by doing that, Absalom created a loyal following. Verse 7, which I'm not going to show you, verse 7 says that this went on for four years. Absalom was a very patient man, spending two years plotting a brother's revenge, going out of town for three, waiting two more years to see his father David, spending four years at a city gate working on a conspiracy behind David's back. And then Absalom lies to his father, and he says, listen, I need, I'm, I'm going to go down to Hebron. I want to fulfill a vow that I made to the Lord when I was in Gesher. And David says, fine, go ahead. And so Absalom goes down to Hebron, a city in southern Israel. He invites 200 men to join him. He invites some of David's own political advisors to come with me to Hebron. While he is in Hebron, he announces and declares himself the new king of Israel. And at this point, some people are ready for a new king. And so it, it creates a, a following. You know, um, he, is, he has won the hearts of many people. They say, great, you know, let's have Absalom, David's son, be the king. David hears that news. David flees Jerusalem, and he leaves 10 of his concubines behind. Concubines are a type of wife, okay? Um, so he leaves 10, 10 of his wives behind and says, you take care of the palace while I'm gone, okay? What Absalom comes into town. He takes over the palace. He takes over the throne. He says, I'm the new king. He is a, he's given advice as a way to, to, to mock his father. He says, why don't you go and have sex with, with your father's ten concubines uh, and do it out in the open. Go out and do it up on the roof of the palace. And so he did. And all of that was, was simply a way to mock his father and shame his father. At this point, David has really lost control of his, com of his kingship and his, his command because he's reaping what he has sowed. Benjamin Franklin once made this comment, said that he that cannot obey cannot command. So David continues to reap what he has sown. Eventually, if you know the story, Absalom is killed, which adds to David's grief. And so David returns to the city. Next Sunday, we're going to look at the different friends who, who befriended David as he was basically a fugitive on the run, a fugitive on the road, and that'll be, be next week. 
But you look at what happened to David after an illustrious career and strong spiritual leader in the nation of Israel. David paid a high price for his sin with Bathsheba. His one night stand turns into years of misery for him and his family. In fact, from, from the time of his, his adultery with Bathsheba to the time of Absalom's death is 12 years, 12 years of pain and misery, of deception and death that he and his family must endure because he made a foolish night, foolish decision one night. And so I, I read that because today we hear about popular spiritual leaders who fall, often sometimes near the, the end of their career or ministry. And so you, and we see this happen in David's life. And it f forced me to ask the question, were there signs prior to Bathsheba that showed us David making wrong choices? Were there signs that showed David going down paths that, that he should have been avoiding? And if you look closely, there were. There were signs. There were paths that he was going down that were, he should have not gone down at all. But they were very subtle. They were easy to, easy to miss. But I want to suggest to you, those were the cracks in the foundation that eventually led to the collapse of, of his kingship, at least for a temporary period of time. Braden and J.D. and I were discussing that this week in staff meeting about David's background, and, and we were talking about the cracks in his foundation. And it was, J.D. made the comment, and, and I agreed that, that uh, some of these initial cracks relate to David's lack of knowledge of the scripture. So his lack of knowledge of the word led him to, to make decisions that created cracks in his foundation. The first was this, way back in Deuteronomy 17, Moses had, had given this command to the nation of Israel, talking about the future kings of Israel, when, when Israel would have, be ruled by nations. And one of the commands was, the king must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. Now, the key word here is many, he shall not take many wives. And admittedly, that's, that's somewhat relative. Okay, for David, having 15 to 20 wives, which he had, was too many. For his son Solomon, 1,000 wives was, was too many, okay. Um, in the New Testament, we read that the command for marriage is one husband, one wife. And we have to be honest, if we look at all of Scripture and David's life, family life was not a strength of David. Often he was unaware of what was going on in and among his children, among his family. Sometimes he was distracted or, or unfocused. Another example of his lack of scripture, and we, we did a whole message on this a few weeks ago. His, another example of his lack of God's word was when he tried moving the Ark of the Covenant on an ox cart, moving it from a, an outside city, move, trying to move it into um, Jerusalem, and it cost the life of a man who tried you know, preventing the Ark from, from falling off the cart. And so he ended up touching the Ark to keep it on the cart, and God struck him dead. And David couldn't understand. This man's doing a, a service for God. Why do you strike him dead? He's trying to protect your ark. But kings in Israel should have known, they should have been taught, they should have been instructed that only Levites carry the ark and they carry it with poles. David forgot that or didn't, know, didn't remember that command at all. And it cost a man his life because David was unaware of what God's word had instructed. So we have to admit, David was a strong leader. He was a wise king. He was a courageous warrior. But, but was he a committed husband? I asked Mark and Edith this question this morning. If you have 20 wives, what does commitment mean? 
I'm not sure. I have the answer. Maybe JD has that answer. You can ask him, okay? And so if you look at David's life, David may have appeared successful. I think he was successful as a, as a king, as, as a commander-in-chief. But I wonder if at home, I wonder if David was an absentee father. It appears that way. With 20 wives and 20 children, it would be hard to connect with all of them and keep up on what each, is, each one is doing. I had to ask myself these questions. Did David know that Amnon had raped his daughter Tamar? I doubt it. Because Amnon had committed a crime that was worthy of death, and yet Absalom and Tamar kept it quiet. And David apparently didn't know that had ever occurred. Did David realize that Absalom had held a grudge for two years, planning revenge against Amnon. I doubt that also. I think David was completely unaware that Absalom was out at the city gate every morning, offering to, to dispense justice to those that had a, had a case, had a concern. I think that was a sign that David was out of touch with, with the common, ordinary citizen. David, was, he, David could win battles against other nations, but part of being a king was dispensing justice and, for his own people, and that wasn't occurring. Now, it's easy to look at David and say, oh, well, look at all of his mistakes, you know? But I think the reality is all of us, every one of us, we have cracks in our foundation. Cracks that, that draw us away from the Lord. Um, sometimes we don't even realize it. They may just be small. We may not even realize the impact they're making. And when you think about what are the cracks in, in my foundation, a key, a key factor here is the ideas and, and the thoughts that we put into our mind. The ideas that you put into your mind end up affecting your behavior. Because sin starts here. Sin starts in your mind, and you begin dwelling on it. Maybe you rationalize. You convince yourself it's okay to do. But it starts right here. Let me give you some examples of, of how cracks can, can appear in our life. Have you ever thought music could do that? Music touches our emotions. Sometimes we hear a song, we really like it, we, we like the tune, we like the beat. We memorize it, and we're unaware of some of the lyrics we're even singing. I had a really uh, abrupt lesson that I experienced. I was a young Christian. I remember driving, driving to church, and I, this will really date me, but I remember driving into the church parking lot listening to an Elton John song, okay? Uh, you don't know who that is. Uh, put, type his name into Google, okay? And so I'd, I'm listening to this Elton John song, and I'm singing the lyrics, and I walked into the church, I walked down the center aisle humming the lyrics to that song, and without realizing, I was singing profanity. And halfway down the aisle, I said, whoa, what am I singing? And I won't tell you what the lyrics were, but it was profanity, and I'm, I'm sitting there going, whoa, God, forgive me. I'm in the middle of church singing profanity because that was the last song in my mind, I, and I... I was not discerning at the time, and all of a sudden it real, I helped me realize maybe I should pay attention to some of the songs I'm singing, you know? 20 years ago when we moved to Bakersfield and somebody said, oh, the most popular radio station in town is, is KUZZ, and I go, oh, God. You've sent me to Bakersfield. I have to start listening to country western music. And so I did, and I found, I saw, I found that I liked it. You know, and I would even use some of the songs. I would play some of the songs in church because the, the song and the lyrics tied in with my message. But I had to also learn and realize some of the lyrics of country western songs are not too godly. You know, who's, who's better, your boots under and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> that doesn't enhance, you know, a strong relationship of marriage, you know. Uh, I remember the very first country western song I ever listened to you know, I thought I'd gone to hell. 
You know, this, this, I turned on, I said, I gotta, I gotta relate to people of Bakersfield. So I turned on KUZZ, and the song was, Bubba shot the jukebox because it played a sad song. And I go, oh, God. You know? That was my introduction. But music, if you're not observant, if you're not discerning, music can create cracks in your spiritual life, cracks that you don't, you don't even think about. But those thoughts, you know, those tunes go through our mind. We sing the lyrics, and they're not, they're not godly at all. Another common TV shows. Annette and I, we really enjoy watching crime shows. But over the years, there have been some crime shows that have gotten so evil and so perverse that we said, we've got to stop watching this. You know, we're going to bed thinking some, you know, we, we've just watched an hour of terrible images on the TV. So this isn't right. Or give me an, another example, and this has only happened in the last few years. How many of you have been watching TV, watching a TV show, and you see a gay couple kiss each other? Okay? That's only happened in the last few years. If you have kids and you're watching that, what does that say? Do you continue watching? Do you say anything? If you, keep, if you just keep watching TV show and your kids think, well, that must be normal. Is that the right thing to do? You know? Sex has always been a temptation, which is why pornography is a problem even in church. The percentage of, of men who watch porn and the percentage of pastors that watch porn is extremely high. What is also equally disturbing is that the percentage of women who are watching porn is increasing. And becoming, that's becoming more common. That's, you know, you know and, and people who watch porn can justify it sometimes by saying, well, at least I'm not having an affair. I'm just you know, watching a video or pictures. But it's, it's a crack. It's a crack in your foundation that's harming your relationship with family and spouse and obviously your relationship with God. For some people who, who come to work late and leave early, may not think anything of it, but what they're doing is they're stealing time from their employer. There may be people who go to work and they take supplies home from the company, thinking, oh, the, the company's not gonna mess this, it's a big company, and they, and they justify that. But if they can justify something small, when they're tempted to take, to take something big, Will they follow through? See, the process, I think, begin, it begins very slowly with little things. It, it becomes a, a way of life, and so we begin to rationalize. And I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. To rationalize is simply nothing more than to believe a rational lie. And once you believe a rational lie and convince yourself that it's okay, then you, what you're saying is, is wrong becomes right. What is wrong becomes acceptable. And we look at David. David, after years of neglect, of neg neglecting his wives and his children, maybe neglecting scripture, I think David saw all of his military victories as, as God's hand of blessing on his life and said, well, well God's blessing my life, you know. Uh, I must be doing okay. You know, um, then there was one night where he decides to stay home and sends Joab to go fight the battle. You take care of the battle. You beat these people before you could do it again. You go fight Ammon. David stays home, and as we saw a couple of weeks ago, he lets his guard down. He is unprepared to fight the battle of temptation that he faces at home. There aren't foreign soldiers he's fighting, but there's a temptation he falls against, he makes wrong choices, and things snowball. But here's what, the problem, the problem didn't start that night. The problem did not start the night he stayed home and saw a woman taking a bath. I think it had been building up for years, allowing cracks in the foundation. They eventually caught up with him. So what are the cracks in your foundation? You know them better than others. If you're honest and think about what are the things that may be displeasing to the Lord, 
See, the most important command Jesus taught us is love the Lord with all your heart. But when we allow cracks in our foundation, our love gets fragmented. We still have love for God, but part of our love is now dedicated toward the cracks. And God wants all of our heart, all of our love. If you want to talk or pray with any of us, uh, we're available. Um, we'd love to, to discuss that with you and help you pray through some of these issues that, that the little things don't end up becoming uh, dangerous that, that uh, cause more harm down the road. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this example, even though it's, it's hard to, to see and hear, David faces uh, extreme consequences for one night of making poor choices, and he ends up going through 12 years of pain and deception and death in his own family. Lord, I pray that that would be a, a motivation and an, an example to us to look at our lives, to examine where, are, where am I allowing cracks in my spiritual foundation of my life what am I allowing in my life, thoughts or ideas or music or TV or entertainment or whatever that, that dishonors you, that draws me away from you? Help us to be honest with ourselves and make those choices that would, would express our love for you with all of our heart. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let me invite you to stand for our final song as we conclude our service. There will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. So let it Today we shout the hymn of heaven with angels and the saints. We raise a mighty roar. Glory to our God who gave us life beyond the grave. Holy, holy is the Let me just conclude by reading one verse from Ephesians 6, talking about the armor of God. Paul writes, says, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, may we stand in God's armor and strength in ways that honor and glorify him. May that be your experience this coming week. God bless you. You're dismissed.